Hello, peeps, fellow bankers, Dr. E here. Man, got that bright light shining in my eyes. Notice how I said eyes. Been in Arkansas too long. Yummy. I made a good uh, latte here on campus. I bought myself a nice machine. And if you're nice to me, I'll make one for you as well when you get back. So we are moving on into a new chapter, a new area of uh, commercial banking. Um, this uh, may be my um, favoritist. You like that word? Favoritist. My most favorite topic in uh, commercial banking and that is managing a bank to deal with the risk of changes in interest rates. We've talked about risks that banks face. Banks face an abundance of risks. Um, they face competitive risks. They face um, economic risks, risks uh, in their market area. They face um, labor risks. They face um, regulatory and legal risks. That's something that really um, makes banking um, different than other uh, industries in that banking is far more regulated, as you know, than other industries. But what we haven't talked much about is the risk posed by changes in interest rates. Um, when interest rates, market interest rates fluctuate all the time, and uh, because banks consist primarily of financial assets and financial liabilities, when interest rates change, the values of assets and liabilities change. And that's what this chapter is about. Recognizing that, measuring that, and trying to control the damage that can happen if you're not careful. All right, so I'm going to step aside here so you can see uh, the slide. I'm still here, though. And um, let's move into um, risk management for changing interest rates. All right, so this chapter focuses on interest rate risk, as I mentioned. And interest rate risk is the impact changes in market rates of interest has on a bank. Changes in interest rates impact both the balance sheet and the income statement for financial firms. So that's one thing that's an important concept you need to keep in mind. The balance sheet and the income statement are affected, both affected, by changes in interest rates. Because of the inverse relationship between interest rates and the value of financial assets and financial liabilities, when interest rates change, the value of a bank's assets, loans, and bond investments, and the value of their liabilities, deposits, and debt, bond debt, also changes. Okay? This could, these changes, and often does, cause the value of the owner's equity to change. And we're going to dig into the details of this. Okay? Remember that assets minus liabilities equals owner's equity. So if assets change or liabilities change or they both change but at different rates, owner's equity is going to change. Changes, so that's how the balance sheet's affected. Changes in interest rates also affect the income that banks earn on assets. Okay? It also changes the interest expense they have to pay on deposits. Okay? This is how changes in rates affect the income statement. The, what you earn on your assets and what you pay on your deposit impacts the income statement. All right. Keep in mind that individual financial firms do not control either the level or the trend of market interest rates. So banks have to deal with the environment that they are, that they encounter. Banks can't change the environment. They can't change interest rates. They must accept them. 
okay, and deal with them. Interest rates themselves represent the equilibrium between thousands of firms that supply credit, mostly banks that supply credit, and millions of borrowers who come to the banks demanding credit. Interest rates represent the price of credit, the price of borrowing. They are what borrowers pay, which is an expense to the borrower, to lenders, which is income to the lenders, as compensation for the use of borrowed funds. For most of their history, banks had very little control over interest rates because of regulations. Interest rates used to be highly regulated. Rates that were paid on, um, on customer accounts were regulated, and rates that were charged on deposits, not on deposits, on loans were regulated. But the regulations have changed quite a bit. Currently in the United States, banks can change the rates they pay on deposits and on loans in response to the needs to they, the need that they have for funds. For example, take a look at the loan demand that they have in their markets. If loan demand accelerates in a bank's market, meaning that business is picking up in that market and business needs capital in order to grow, banks can raise rates on what they pay on deposits higher than what the competitors pay and they will attract more deposits which will then fund the loans that they need to make. In the past, all the banks paid the same uh, rates on deposits and so uh, banks had no control over the level of deposits that they had. All right, interest rates are expressed as percentage points, 10%, 8%, and as basis points, which is an important financial uh, instrument or measure, the basis point. The basis point is one one hundredth of a percentage point, which is, uh, which is 0 0.01. A percentage point is 0 0.01, so a basis point is 0 0.0001 or 0.1%. Okay. For example, 50 basis points uh, is equal to 0 0.005 or 0.5% or one half of 1%. That would be 50 basis points. Two common ways interest rates are computed are the yield to maturity. We've done that in Manfin. Compute I Y. Let's take a look. This is the cost of funds used when the amount paid at maturity is not the same as the amount initially borrowed. Let's take a look. It's like buying a bond at a premium or at a discount. It is a true rate. For example, a bond has a 6% coupon rate. Remember what you use the coupon rate for. You multiply the coupon rate times the par value to determine the coupon payment. All right. It's paid semi-annually for five years, five times two, ten. The bond's current market price is $950. Okay, so if you buy the bond today at $950, you're going to get $60 a year, $30 every six months, and at the end of five years, you get $1,000. What yield are you earning? Now the bond is paying, a, is priced at a discount, which means that the yield to maturity, the true rate you're going to earn, is higher than the coupon rate. Market rates have risen, and the bond is now trading at a discount. So let's find out what the current market rate of yield to maturity is. 1,000 is the future value. 950 plus minus is the present value. $30 is the payment, which is 6% times 1,000 divided by 2. 10 is the end, which is 5 times 2. Compute IY 3.6%, that is the semi-annual IY times two payments per year, 7.2%. I told you the yield of maturity was higher than the coupon rate. This is the yield of maturity, which you're truly earning or paying. All right, another common interest rate calculation is called the bank discount rate. 
the bank discount rate is equal to 100 minus the purchase price of a loan or of a security divided by 100. Let's take a look. Times 360 days divided by the number of days to maturity. Let's look at an example. All right. For example, a bank loans $960 to a customer. The customer must pay back $1,000 at the end. Okay. The loan term is 90 days. The bank discount rate is $1,000, the total amount of the loan, 100% of the loan, minus the purchase price, okay, which is $960, which is what they're getting, okay, divided by what they're getting in the future, $1,000, okay, times 360 divided by 90, which is 4, okay. So it's $40 divided by 1,000 times 4, 16% is the bank discount rate. This is a calculation that banks do. There were other interest rates included, but I excluded them, and we're focusing mostly on yield to maturity and the bank discount rate. All right. Market rates are, are a function of and we've gone over this in investments and we went over this in Manfin. What are the components of interest rates? Well, there's the real risk-free rate of interest, and that is a function of the supply and the demand for funds. Okay? The supply is controlled by the Fed, and the demand is controlled by business folks, the economy, and the government, borrowers. Okay? The Fed and the savings rate by depositors affects the supply. So if people decide they're going to save more, they will deposit more in the bank. That will increase the money supply. Okay? The level or pace of economic activities and the expected returns on investments affects the demand for credit. The higher the return a business expects, the more they're going to borrow. All right. And then, on top of the real risk-free rate, we have risk premiums, extra return that is paid, added to the interest rate, to compensate for default risk. This is the risk, the risk that borrowers will not repay the loan, otherwise called credit risk. Inflation risk, okay, prices rise. So future loan payments that a bank receives or an investor receives, payments in the future, $100 five years from now will not buy the same amount of goods and services as $100 will buy today because of inflation. Okay? Liquidity risk. Can a bank sell a loan to another bank quickly and at a fair price for cash? And then call risk. Borrowers repay a loan more quickly than expected, which reduces the yield on the loan. Okay? So on the one end, you have default risk. On the other end, you have call risk. Then lastly, maturity risk. Longer-term loans are subject to more uncertainty, which increases the probability of a negative event. You get a home loan over a 30-year period of time, that, that gives the borrower 30 years to become unemployed or to become bankrupt somehow. And so longer term loans have more risk uh, of negative events than short term loans. Generally, not always the case. All right, let's look at yield curves. We, we are covering the basics of interest rates in order to set the foundation for managing interest rate risk. So let's look at yield curves. Again, this is something we've looked at in Manfin and in um, investments. So a yield curve is a graphical illustration of the relationship between yield to maturity, which you earn on loans and bonds, and the maturity in years. Okay? Yield curves are done uh, for bonds that have the same credit rating. So you have 
yield curves for AA rated treasuries, for A rated treasuries, for A rated corporates, uh, AA rated corporates, triple B rated corporates. So you have to have the same default risk or credit rating for all the bonds on a yield curve and then you have years to maturity and yield to maturity. Now the yield curve has two shapes. Okay, The shape or the slope of the yield curve reflects the policies of the Fed. It also reflects the outlook investors have for economic activity and for CPI, the consumer uh, price index, which is inflation. Okay, So here's a normal or positive slope, and this is the way the yield curve looks 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time. Okay, Long-term rates out here are higher than short-term rates here. Okay. This indicates that the Fed is keeping short-term rates normal, okay, low to normal, to keep the economy going. High interest rates cause uh, borrowers to borrow less, which slows the economy down. Okay? Investors ex expect normal inflation in the future because rates are rising to indicate that inflation has to be paid for, and they expect um, decent economic growth. Okay? Now, the other 5% of the time, maybe 10% of the time, we have what's called an inverted yield curve. All right? And with an inverted yield curve, short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. And the reason that is, is the Fed controls short-term rates and the market controls long-term rates. So short-term rates are driven up by the Fed. The Fed takes money out of the system in order to drive the interest rates up and um, why do they do this? To try to slow the economy down to fight inflation or to fight a bubble in the stock market, the bond market, the housing market, or the commodities market. The Fed is saying things are getting too hot. We need to slow it down. How do we slow things down? We raise interest rates. We take money out of the system, raise interest rates. And when we do, investors stop borrowing as much. They expect inflation to drop. They expect demand for money and economic growth to drop. And so long-term rates come down, short-term rates have gone up, and we get what's called an inverted yield curve. And every uh, recession, except the one that we're in uh, now due to the coronavirus, has been preceded by an inverted yield curve. When the yield curve inverts, that is signaling a recession. Not all the time. Sometimes we have an inverted yield curve, but we don't have a recession. But every time, except this time, when we have a recession, we first had an inverted yield curve. All right. You know what? Let's take a break right there. I think that's a good place to stop because we're going to um, start talking about asset liability management.